Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today in another zoonosis talk, um, explaining once again why protecting animals and the environment ultimately protects yourself. Uh, today we're going to try to get under your skin a little bit and by popular demand Today's topic is mange and dermatophytes, or commonly called also ringworm. My name's Dr. Isabel. So yeah, common zoonotic skin diseases. We are talking about two conditions today with mange and ringworm and we're lumping them together because they both affect the skin but they are indeed quite different so as in all of our zoonosis talks we're going to first present what are the causing agents of this these diseases then we will talk about prevalence and how common these diseases are we will briefly introduce what these diseases look like in animals, as well as what does it look like in humans. Then we will present how do we get it? How can we diagnose it and know that we have it? And of course, last but not least, and most importantly, how do we avoid getting this disease? Talking about prevention a little bit about treatment and then in the very end I have some resources for you for further information and guidance as well. So let's jump into it and reintroduce the One Health concept which connects the health of humans to the health of our animals both domestic as well as wild and the shared environment between us all. And we do so because we realize that when we protect one, we actually protect them all. We wanted to remind you once again uh, that zoonotic diseases are diseases that are shared between animals and people, and they can be transferred in both directions. And if you have seen some of our previous talks, then you may remember that more than half of the infections that humans get are actually spread between animals and people, aka zoonotic diseases. This is what makes these diseases so important as well as animal health important to human health. So some general remarks first on the skin diseases and their connection to One Health. It is first of all, very, very common to see signs of skin infections and lesions in our domestic animals as well as wildlife uh, on intake. Skin infections are the most common infections in both animal as well as human medicine. The effects of these infections are very variable. So it can be just a simple irritation and it can lead all the way to life-threatening conditions in some cases. Something that is important about both of these conditions is that both humans and animals can be infectious, meaning they can infect others without they themselves showing signs. And then especially for the ringworm, the fungal stages, they can survive a long time in the environment. So some of those fungal and parasitic diseases can infect you and your children and cause severe zoonotic rashes. It is important to realize that these diseases can only be identified with the help of a complete examination and in most cases 
microscopy. So we cannot identify them just from the looks, even though there may be some more typical looks for one or the other. It always requires further diagnostic and a complete examination. So let's talk about causing agents. First of all, we have two diseases here, as mentioned. We have sarcoptic mange, also called scabies or sarna in Spanish. And there are other common names. Uh, this is caused by an acarid, which is a mite. And the family is sarcoptus. The species is sarcoptus scabiei. This is one species, but there is further research going on into potential genetic differences between uh, them in different host species. Our second disease today, the so-called ringworm, is also in humans, sometimes called tinea, or the causing agents in general are classified as dermatophytes, which translates into skin fungi. It's in the class of fungi. And there are around 40 different species of dermatophytes. And common names involved here are trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton, for example. And here we have two images. Now here, this is the mite that causes sarcoptic mange. And then here we actually do not have images of the fungi, but we have images of the typical lesions here. Now to how common is this? The prevalence for both of these diseases is very high. So it is very common. If we're talking about sarcoptic mange, it is very common in animals. It is actually described as one of the most commonly diagnosed skin diseases in dogs, that is, and it can infect a huge range of other species. So over a hundred different species can become infected. Other species aside dogs that are very important to us as pets that infect humans frequently can be pocket pets as well, but of course also wildlife species. In wildlife species, Sarcoptic mange is causing more and more concerns, and it is often spread from domestic animals to wildlife. In humans, according to the World Health Organization website, there are an estimated 200 million people infected at one time with sarcoptic mange. And in certain poor areas, it's up to 10% of children that are suffering from scabies. However, in the environment, the prevalence is not as high for sarcoptic mites, that is, because they are deep burrowing mites and they do not survive very long in the environment, thankfully. If we talk about ringworm, which is a fungus, this is world, world very common, not just in animals, but also in humans. Extremely common with estimates of up to 25% of the global population infected with skin fungi. It is also extremely common in domestic and uh, wild animals. For both of these diseases, many species can be infected asymptomatically. What that means is they don't show any signs, yet they carry these disease agents. So we have here as examples for very common sources for us, dogs, cats, cows, sheep, but many wildlife species as well. And as opposed to sarcoptic mites, fungal stages, are very resistant in the environment and can remain infectious for a next host for here it was stated between 12 and 20 months. So what does it look like in animals? Here is an example of one of our patients that was diagnosed with sarcoptic mange. This is a baby Coati uh, already a few weeks into the disease after treatment with no more open sores, but a lot of hair loss, obvious. 
So in this case, this was not asymptomatic, but it had a lot of crusts, very hardened skin, scabs, and erosions that with treatment eventually um, resolved. And then another four to six weeks later, the little animal started regrowing hair um, with the elimination of these mites. So sarcoptic mange affects young animals as well as adult animals. It will affect immunocompromised animals or um, chronically ill wildlife more so than healthy animals. And very often sarcoptic mange is further complicated by secondary bacterial or uh, fungal infections. It is very itchy in general, uh, both in animals as well as humans. Sarcoptic mange can cause very, very severe itch. So ringworm in animals can again be without symptoms. Similar to mange, it will lead to hair loss, which in the case of ringworm, can be circular, so the name of ringworm, these round lesions, but that is not always so. In most cases of fungal skin infections, these develop very slowly, so over the course of weeks, and they tend to cause a little less itch than our mite infestations. We can see a single lesion we can also see multiple lesions, and this can also be generalized and be very, very serious at that point. So this affects, again, young animals more, but it can also affect adults and similar to mange, or even more so, fungal infections affect immunocompromised animals much more so than healthy individuals. And again, similar to mange, Fungal infections are often also complicated by bacterial and or parasitic infections. So how do we get it? Three main ways, and this applies to both. So in both scabies or ringworm, we can acquire this through direct contact with an infected human. So we do not just get this disease from animals, but we can also spread it from human to human. We can get it from an infected animal, like this little kitty here that has a little lesion on the face. And last but not least, especially so for fungal infections, we can acquire them from the environment. Because as mentioned before, these fungal stages can remain infectious in the environment for up to two years. The mange mites, however, will only survive a short period of time in the environment, but they can also be spread, for example, with clippers that have contaminated skin from an infected animal in them. And then here we have this image of the foot. For example, athlete's foot is a skin fungus as well at cause for this condition. So how does this look in humans? There are very few images that I found on the um, World Health Organization and CDC websites. And this is where I got this description. What is typical, the first infection with scabies will generally take several weeks, two to actually eight weeks until the symptoms appear. Yet during this period, the person can already be infectious to other humans as well. So this is very contagious. When the second infection is acquired, this is usually symptomatic really quick. This is linked to the fact that the reaction and the symptoms that humans experience are actually linked to an allergic reaction, which takes some time to develop the first time around, but for a second infection, uh, our immune system reacts much quicker. Scabies causes very severe itch. This is often even more so at night. And then we see 
these whelps and then uh, pustules, as you can see in these pictures here. Similar to animals, because of the severe itch, the scratching will often cause secondary bacterial infections and fungal infections as well. Here's some images of ringworm in humans. It's described as a common fungal infection causing a circular rash shaped like a ring that is usually red and itchy. So ringworm too can be itchy, but it tends to be much less itchy than burrowing mites are. As mentioned before, it develops slowly. It can be a single lesion, but it can also develop in some, into something like this. Um, there are different locations depending on what parts are exposed. And again, similar to animals, immunocompromised humans are what's called predisposed. So if you develop a ringworm infection, it is also recommended to check with your doctor to ensure your immune system's health. So how do we know that we have it? We are not diagnosing any diseases through a presentation here, but this needs to be confirmed by a licensed veterinarian in animals and a medical doctor in humans. But in general, in animals, we use the clinical signs, the somewhat typical lesions, and then skin scrapings to identify either fungal stages or mites. We have to know that these tests can often be false negative, and one negative test result does not mean that the animal does not have these parasites. It is generally required to do these skin scrapings up to three to five times. And when it comes to skin fungi, we have an additional method here with the so-called wood slam that you see in this image here. About 50% of skin fungi may uh, fluoresce in the wood slam. And that's what you can see here. This is actually a tamandua mouth, the same one from the picture before with this wood slam showing very strong fluorescence all where we could before see the lesions on the mouth. In humans, it is similar that the clinical symptoms help to suspect this diagnosis. And then I have actually not heard of skin scrapings in humans. I assume they potentially should be done as well. And I just noted here, if you have itchy rashes on you and you're working with animals, remember to tell your physician that you've had contact with animals to uh, include this uh, as a differential. There is a fungal culture to confirm fungal infections, but this is usually a slow growing culture. So many times treatment will be instated before the fungal culture confirms the diagnosis. So most importantly, how do we prevent these diseases? Number one, keeping your pets healthy protects you and keeping them on regular preventatives for mites so that they do not acquire these mites or maintain these mites and do not infect you. If you do see any lesions on your pets, we recommend cleaning them uh, with a uh, antiseptic and keeping them under close observation and having them checked by a veterinarian to make sure that your pets who may share close quarters with you do not carry these infectious diseases that you could get from them. We recommend using proper protective equipment, so wearing gloves when working with infected animals. And of course, we have to remember that they could be infected without showing signs. In humans, we just want to ensure that you are aware of these diseases, and especially for immune compromised humans, the recommendation is actually to avoid contact if possible. There are some special recommendations and 
uh, guidelines by the CDC as well for immunocompromised humans who may have a pet with uh, either of these diseases uh, that are uh, linked down here. So it is recommended as always to wash your hands after touching animals. Another recommendation on the CDC website was to, for example, vacuum to remove skin flakes and other potentially infectious agents from your immediate environment and or wearing shoes in contaminated environment. And there is a whole long list in these references. So a couple more CDC images here to remind you, always wash your hands after touching, feeding or playing with your pets. Take your pet to the vet uh, that will help keep them healthy and happy and it will keep you healthy as well. A little bit on treatments. So we cannot again prescribe treatments in a presentation like this, but it requires a veterinary or physician's examination to differentiate what is it that you are dealing with because fungal, parasitic and bacterial infections may have some semi-characteristic looks to them, but very often overlap and they cannot be differentiated without these diagnostics mentioned before, AKA microscopy or culture. And then there are different antifungal as well as antiparasitic treatments that will be prescribed starting oftentimes with ointments and localized treatments. But when we have very severe progressed uh, infections, then it may come to generalized infections and also systemic treatments. One last point here for fungal infections. In general, there are very long treatments because fungi develop slowly and the treatment also takes a long time and uh, it is often not completed, which then leads to reoccurrence. So here are some resources that were used and that we recommend for you to check into to find a little more information on keeping pets and people healthy, as well as CDC references on scabies and ringworm, as well as prevention and what to do if you have an infected pet. And then for veterinarians and other health professionals, we also very highly recommend the Companion Animal Parasite Council, which has guidelines on many parasitic diseases, including all of these zoonotic diseases, uh, including these here. So please do not hesitate to send us any questions right now via chat, via email, and we look forward to hear from you and hope this helps you to stay safe. Thank you very much.